Okay, so hi everyone. Uh, today will be our last uh, IYCN Science Cafe for this year uh, for the top 10 emerging technology for 2022. Uh, we are lucky to have with us Professor Eric Mikhail from McGill University. He's going to talk uh, with us about sodium ion batteries. So to begin, who are we? Uh, I'm uh, Wade Heba. I am the IYCN Conference Persons Chair together with Tracy Lowe. Tracy, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi everyone, my name is Tracy Lau. I am co-chair along with Walid Heber. I will also pass it along to our committee member, Jian, to introduce himself. Yeah, hello everyone, my name is Jian. Uh, I'm a member of Conference Prizes Committee of IYCN and uh, uh, I'm, I'm very glad to co-organize the event. Uh, and, uh, here I want to thank Professor uh, Dr. Eric Metalla to uh, accept uh, the invitation and also audience for joining us today. And uh, now um, I will hand over to Wally. Okay, so our time schedule will be as follows. We will have five minutes to introduce ourselves, followed by 30 minutes presentation by Professor Eric, followed by Q&A session and closing remarks. So who is the IYCN? The IYCN is an associated organization of the IUPAC since 2017. Our vision is to connect and empower younger chemists globally. Our mission is to support and advocate younger scientists across the chemical sciences toward a globally sustainable future. So if anyone is interested in joining us, please fill our form through the link provided. It's completely for free. Uh, also, if you want to connect with us, you can either send us an email or follow us through various social media platforms from Instagram to X, uh, previously Twitter, Facebook and LinkedIn. So now a brief introduction about our uh, speaker, Professor Eric McKill. He completed his PhD at their house in 2013 and, uh, and went as a postdoc at, the, at College de France in 2015, both of which focus on batteries material research. He completed a postdoc at the University of Minnesota looking at electronic and magnetic properties of complex oxides and since 2018, he has been an associate professor in the chemistry department of McGill, McGill University. His group focus on uh, his research group focus on developing high and applying high put through uh, methods to accelerate the development and understanding of advanced battery materials. He is the author, uh, he is the author and co-author of 54 published articles, 21 of them as a principal investigator. Without further ado, Professor Eric. Well, it's my pleasure to be here, and thank you, Walid, for the, the nice introduction. Um, it's always it's always great to be, uh, be part of webinars and other presentations for students, um, so I, I look forward to the question period. Um, so let, let me introduce the, the topic and uh, give an idea of what I'll, I'll be talking about. So sodium ion batteries, th these are emerging technologies uh, potentially to supplement or even replace lithium ion batteries. So very important applications. And we're very interested in the role of sodium ion batteries, obviously in sustainability, right? Sodium versus lithium, there's obvious reasons to go in that direction. But really the performance is gonna be a big, big question. So this is what my, my talk's gonna be about. I'm gonna first introduce um, <coughs> the, these technologies and then uh, talk a little bit about the research going on in my group and how we're trying to improve the performance so that this you know game-changing improvement in sustainability can actually become a reality so we have lithium-ion batteries they're well established so why are we still working on battery technologies right we have batteries for personal electronics you know we're talking about two billion batteries a year here and for the most part, they end up in landfills. We're, we're working on recycling. It's, it's coming along, and some jurisdictions are better than others. Uh, but basically, the scale here is 2 billion batteries a year. Uh, then we go look at electric vehicles. Right? And now we're really talking about uh, a very important application for reducing the CO2 footprint. Right? Let's get rid of gasoline cars and replace them with electric vehicles. So if we just use Tesla's as a benchmark, because they use batteries that are 
on a similar scale as the ones used in personal electronics. They use 7,000 batteries per Tesla. So there's one, almost 1 1.5 billion cars on the planet right now. So really the dream here is to make 10,000 billion batteries. Now this is a very daunting scale. And when we start talking about the amount of lithium, this scale becomes important. So we'll, I'll, I'll mention that on the next slide. And then if we really want to think big, we need that energy storage for, to, to support grid scale uh, intermittent renewable sources, right? We have wind turbines and solar panels being scaled up at an exponential rate. We need the storage to, to keep up with it because they're intermittent. So we need to store the energy while, while it's being collected when it's sunny out. And then three or four hours later, we need to, to use it. So the scale of 10,000 billion batteries, that would support about 16 billion homes. Right, so that's six hours of energy use. So in 2021, there were 2.3 billion houses in the world. So this scale is not insane. This is roughly what we need if we want to do these applications, you know, for for green, you know, real game-changing uh, environmental impact. So what does 10,000 billion batteries mean? That, that's the real question, right? So do we need to go beyond lithium? So just a quick back of the envelope calculation here, the lithium reserve estimates are 89 million tons. Well, what does that mean? A Tesla car contains about five to eight kilograms, according to my Google. So the known reserves will power about 11 to 17 billion cars. So our dream of 1.5 billion cars, those are all the cars we have today. This is, you know, more than 10% of the known lithium reserves. So this is a very, very important amount of lithium. And we don't know how to recycle it yet, right? So there's all sorts of questions here, okay? We're talking about putting a large fraction of the world's lithium reserves into cars. Well, maybe that's not such a good idea. Maybe lithium is not the end game, especially if we start talking about doing it for grid storage. And there are, I'll, I'll show in a second, there are other two other components in lithium ion batteries that from a sustainability point of view are a, an even bigger problem, and that's nickel and cobalt. So the questions we're asking with sodium ion batteries is one, can we replace lithium for sodium? And what does that mean for sustainability? And can we get rid of nickel and cobalt? Can we do it all at once? And then we have something really interesting. So hopefully that kind of lays the, uh, the, the story of why sodium ion batteries are, are getting so much attention right now. Um, they had been worked on you know, decades ago and then dropped in favor of lithium ion, and now we're coming back to them. And it's really because of the sustainability side of things. So let's talk a little bit about what a state-of-the-art lithium ion battery is and then I'll transition towards my group's research. <clears throat> so in a, a lithium ion battery, we have a cathode, which has lithium in it when we make it. So it's usually a layered oxide. And I'm going to talk about the layered oxides for sodium ion as well. So basically I have a layer of lithium, layer of oxygen in red, and then a layer of transition metal. So for lithium ion batteries, this historically was a lot of cobalt. Now we're transitioning towards nickel with some manganese, uh, but we still have those elements that are a sustainability problem and a price problem because the, the abundance is so low that the price just fluctuates like crazy. So we have this cathode and as we charge the battery, we take the lithium out from the cathode through the liquid electrolyte into the anode, which is graphite. So it's carbon, but it's not the most sustainable carbon. Uh, there's not an infinite amount of natural gra graphite that is battery grade. So there are sustainability issues as well on the anode side, but I'll talk mostly about cathodes today. So when we charge it, the voltage increases and we get a plateau at a certain voltage. And this corresponds to the redox of the transition metal. So in this case, cobalt, it's oxidized from three plus to four plus at this voltage of four volts. So that's why we have a plateau here. And then it increases to whatever we choose as our maximum voltage. And then we turn around and discharge it and it comes back down and lithium returns to the cathode. 
So that's the, the, the secondary battery. That's why it's reversible and we can charge it and use it over and over again. And the important feature, well, there are a number of important features on this curve. <laughs> the main one, well, the main one from a sustainability point of view, especially when we talk about grid storage, is efficiency. So the area underneath this curve is the energy that they can store, that the battery can store. And so on charge here, the area is slightly larger than on discharge, right? This curve on discharge comes a little bit lower in voltage and stops a little bit before zero. So if you take that ratio, it's actually about 90%. So lithium ion batteries are 90% efficient. So if we're taking energy from a solar panel, 90% of it goes back in the grid when it's needed. So this is a really important property. And when you compare to other technologies, this, this needs to be taken into account. <clears throat> so one thing we're gonna be looking at in sodium ion batteries and with the work that I'm gonna show is, you know, is the efficiency high? Are we creating a large difference in the voltage between charge and discharge? That would be bad. And are we getting a lot of irreversible capacity? So these are all features that are bad. If you've done some electrochemistry, you're probably used to seeing data like this, which is what, what you get from a cyclic voltammogram. And my group does a lot of CVs, a lot of cyclic voltammograms. So here, where we had a plateau at four volts, in a CV, it becomes a peak at that voltage. Okay, so it's the same information, it's just plotted differently. So when we have a peak here, that corresponds to a plateau in the voltage curve. And where we had a difference in voltage here, it becomes a different in the x-axis in the position of the peaks. So this peak is at a lower voltage than here. That difference corresponds to this difference between the plateaus. So we have very much the same information. It's just shown in a different form. So hopefully that, that gives a decent introduction into you know, state-of-the-art lithium-ion batteries and the kind of battery testing that we do in a lab. So what happens when we go from a lithium ion battery to a sodium ion battery? What's the grocery list? And from a sustainability point of view, this is really important. So on the, the lithium ion battery, I've mentioned this already, we have graphite, not the worst for sustainability, but you know, a concern down the line when we start scaling up the EVs the way we're doing now. Lithium is a big concern. As I mentioned, cobalt and nickel is critical. Uh, we, we need to solve this you know, in a very short time frame. <clears throat> it also uses manganese and aluminum, and these are good from a sustainability point of view. So there's a lot of work going on on the lithium ion battery side of things to make them more sustainable. But the game changer could very well be sodium ion. So here the grocery list becomes, instead of graphite, we use hard carbon. And this can be scaled up. Uh, basically, almost any carbon source uh, can be turned into hard carbon uh, in, in a, a lab, lab setting. <clears throat> We're using sodium instead of lithium, way more abundant, never going to be a concern. And then my group and a lot of other groups are working heavily on making manganese and iron work uh, instead of cobalt and nickel. And turns out this is really hard. This is what I'm gonna talk about for the rest of today. Can we make it work? Can we make these cathodes work with sodium, manganese, and iron only? Because if we can, then it's, it's game changing, right? We, we don't have to worry about the scale up uh, that's going on now. But the question is performance. Will the energy density be the same? Uh, it looks like we're gonna get close. Um, lifetime, will they last as long? Uh, it's not sustainable if you have to replace them five times more often, right? So these are all important questions. And another issue that comes up with the sodium ion cathodes that doesn't with the lithium is air stability. So if we make these materials and then store them you know, in a package while we ship it halfway around the world before we put it in a battery, these can decompose. And they decompose into the things that are no longer good battery materials. So we're working on all three of these in my group. So this is what I'm gonna talk about for the rest of my, my talk. <clears throat> so how do we increase energy density? Well, these are layered oxides. So you have this transition metal with oxygen above and below. This is the, the layers that I was showing at the beginning. 
This is actually an octahedral environment. So we have these D bands of the transition metal that are split. And the Fermi level is normally in a T2G. So when we take sodium from the cathode and put it into the anode, we're also taking an electron and moving it by the external circuit. And the electron has this energy or change in energy as it goes from the cathode to the anode. And that change in energy is our voltage. So if we want to increase our voltage, we have to move these bands down. If we want to increase the capacity, the amount of lithium or in this case sodium, uh, and the amount of redox that's accessible, well, we can basically empty out this D band and then we need more redox. And in a lot of these materials, the oxygen is too low. It's at too high a voltage. So the other thing we can try to do is move these oxygen bands up so that we can access them. That's another way to get higher energy density. And I'll, I'll come back to this in my group's data uh, in, in, uh, in several slides. <laughs> but this is conceptually what's going on in the battery. You get a change in energy uh, of the electron as you go from the cathode to the anode. And the, what limits how much sodium you can take out and put back in is how many electrons you have in these bands that are accessible at the voltages that you want to work at. Hopefully that makes sense. And just for fun, we have this extra challenge that the electrolyte has to be stable. And that's very challenging in these, these batteries. I won't, I won't focus too much on that in, the, in my talk. It'll be on the cathode. But I do want to highlight that the liquid electrolyte is a really important part of the story, especially as we're trying to compete with lithium ion batteries, where the, the liquid electrolyte has been developed for decades so that the lifetime of the battery is very good. So that work has, you know, very important work that needs to continue for sodium ion batteries. All right, so here we go. What, what does my group work on? We, we do a lot of high throughput research. So instead of making one sample at a time, we try to make 64. And we start from solution. So we essentially pipette or use a solution dispensing robot to prepare mixtures of our precursors. And then we use the sole gel method to, to synthesize them. So we basically use a chelating agent like citric acid and then dry the samples into gels that are well mixed and then heat them to higher temperature. So we, we use this, I call it a smokestack. It's a piece of aluminum with some holes in it. And it just prevents all these little samples from mixing. And then we end up uh, after heating to really high temperature uh, for sodium ion batteries, it tends to be 850 degrees Celsius that we use. We end up with small cathodes essentially. So these are about five milligrams in scale to give you an idea. These cups are half a milliliter, so they're about this big. So we do combinatorial research. We, we do it on a small scale so that we can do a lot at once. And then we take these powders and we do x-ray diffraction. So we have high throughput x-ray diffraction that can keep up with all of these samples. And then we retrieve those same powders from the XRD. So we know the structure based on the XRD. And then we can put them into our home assembled high throughput electrochemical cells. So we basically have 64 pads that we can put 64 electrodes onto. So we mix our, our cathodes here uh, with carbon to make them conductive, carbon black. And also we use a binder so they don't detach from the, uh, from the contact here. And then we, we close up the battery. So we put electrolyte on the separator and we have one piece of sodium on the other side. So we actually end up with 64 batteries, all connected in parallel. And that means that we can control the voltage. This is why we do cyclic voltammetry. So we sweep the voltage and measure the current. And we can do it on all 64 at once. Okay. We also do a lot of elemental analysis. So after we heat at 850 degrees, we lose some sodium. So we have to figure out how much sodium is left and do, did we make what we think we made. So we do elemental analysis, but the, the main high throughput that we do is structure and the electrochemistry. And I'll actually show a little bit of XPS uh, today 
which was also very helpful in understanding what's going on in these materials. Okay, and we do a balance of automation and sort of automated. Uh, here we could use a robot or sometimes my students find it's just faster to pipette and they do it very well. Um, so we use whatever we need to to increase our throughput so that we can do some really interesting science. And so the workflow looks something like this. We end up making these 64 samples on a plate. We get 64 XRDs in 10 hours. So we can run two of these plates a day. <clears throat> the electrochemistry takes about one to two weeks and we have 10 of these channels. So we can run 640 samples at once. And then in two to three weeks, we can have this phase diagram basically. So 64 samples can map out a ternary diagram. I'll show some of these for sodium ion batteries. And so we have the, the, the structure is this phase diagram. We can see these boundaries of these single phase regions. And then we also have the electrical, uh, sorry, electrochemical performance in the color. So we can map the battery performance to the composition and the structure, you know, very efficiently. So the maximum throughput of the lab is almost 900 XRDs a week. It takes two minutes to load them and then they run for 10 hours. So we do that twice a day and that's 45,000 XRDs a year is the maximum throughput of the lab. We can have almost 600 cells running at once. Actually, this is old, 640 is what we can do now. Um, <coughs> typical researchers in the group make about 1500 samples per year. So we get a lot of data, very systematic data, right? They're, they're all made at the same time, same conditions and ran at the same conditions. So we get very good comparisons between samples. So let's see what we can learn. So just a quick summary of, of what we've done on sodium ion batteries, and then I'll go through some details. So on these layered oxides, I mentioned that the dream is to get sodium iron manganese to work, but People find that this isn't good enough. You, you have to make substitutions. People have tried nickel, rhodium, tin, it, the list goes on and on, but not systematically, not like I've been talking about. So we don't really know what is the best, what, what's the impact of each of these dopants? How do they work together? There's a lot of questions. So first thing we did was to make sure we were able to make these small samples and they, they perform the exact same way as when you make kilograms of the stuff. It's really important that we do this high throughput in a way that scales up. And so that was the first paper. I won't talk too much about this. Um, th this worked very well. The, the performance is very comparable to what you get in large scale. So then we went on and did a ternary diagram and we found some very interesting materials. I'll, I'll talk about this in more detail. And then we took a composition down here and doped it systematically with 52 different elements to see which ones would improve things. And I'm going to talk about this, this paper as well uh, in a couple slides. Um, we, we learn a lot very quickly about, you know, systematically across the periodic table, what's the impact of making these substitutions. And this work is now continuing with a industrial collaborator, Umicore who's one of the world leaders in cathode materials uh, for lithium ion batteries. And now they're starting to work on, on sodium ion as well. And so we're, I'll, I'll show a little bit of the, the collaboration with them as well at the very end. Okay, so here goes, what does this look like? <coughs> the ternary diagram has sodium at this corner, iron up here and manganese down there. And prior to our work, we knew from, from other literature that there were two materials up here in a phase called P2. So the, the, the phases in sodium ion batteries just talk about the ways that the layers are stacked. And it has some impact, but really what we want is to make a single phase layer material and screen the, the battery performance. So there were two materials known to be up here and one down here, and that was it. And we were able to find in a very short period that there's actually a large solid solution. There's a big region here. We can change the iron content very, very uh, significantly. And we can change the sodium content. So there's a lot to play on. 
It's not just one composition and we're done. So this is really important to realize that there's a lot of region to screen. <laughs> and then we found two other phases and the stars here mark the ones that were in the literature before. So there was one of each of these and we found again, a large region. So it's really important from the structure point of view to understand how flexible the structure is. Does it have to be exactly half sodium or can it tolerate uh, off stoichiometry? And what's the impact of that on the battery performance? So I'll focus on the cyan region. All three are very interesting and we're following up on all three, but just for time, let's, let's focus on this one. It's the one that showed the best performance in electrochemistry uh, of the three. And it's the cyan region here. So if we look at a material that sits on this binary here, it has no iron and it has a lot of little peaks. It's this material here and even here, you still see these little peaks. If you do a lot of work, and this was already done in the literature, you learn that these little peaks are phase transitions. So as the sodium is being removed and put into the material, the structure is changing. It's not robust. And over time, that leads to bad cycling. So the capacity, the energy that you can store goes down dramatically with time. If you add 5% iron and 10% iron, those little wiggles are gone. And in this P2 phase, systematically you get a very smooth curve. And so we know, and we, we did extended cycling, and we, we know that this leads to really good performance. And so in terms of energy density and cycling, the best material in this phase diagram was this one here. So this is the star, okay? <laughs> so that's great. We, we found that 5% iron is sufficient to suppress the phase transition, 10%, you know, really good performance. So what's the problem? Why are, why are we not, you know, filing patents and going to, to commercialization? And the main reason is air stability. <laughs> these, these materials are really good. And th these are probably gonna be next generation sodium ion batteries. The sodium ion batteries have been commercialized recently. Uh, with a different cathode and these you know appear to be the, the next generation ones these layered oxides so people are working very actively on this uh, the issue is that they react with both carbon dioxide and water aggressively enough that it's, it's really hard to handle them and make them into batteries with the infrastructure we have now so if you want to be game changing for going from lithium ion batteries to sodium ion batteries for evs you can't completely reinvent the manufacturing. You need to almost switch it over without, without changing the, the factory floor. And so you need these things to be more stable. So we did XPS and in pink, you can see this carbonate peak changes really dramatically with composition. And in fact, if we do a map, we can see that with iron, you get more and more carbonate. So being down here means that you're reacting less with carbon dioxide. So that's really encouraging, that's great. And then you look at sodium. So there was too much sodium in these samples based on the stoichiometry. And there was also too much for just being carbonate. The sodium to, to carbon ratio was to where we had this blue region. So where it reacts with carbon dioxide, we had sodium carbonate only. Elsewhere, we had another sodium byproduct. And it's basically sodium hydroxide is the, the short version of the story. So up here, we're reacting strongly with water. So we react with carbonate when we have too much iron. Over here in the P2 phase, we react with water. Down here, that's mitigated, but we're still reacting with water. So the star that we made down here is much improved for, for air stability over you know, some of the other compositions that have been studied before, but it's still not good enough. It's still not stable enough to be commercialized. So we want to go look to see if doping can, can be the answer. <coughs> so here we took sodium manganese oxygen. So we took the iron away and we wanted to see what other substitu substituent could play the same role of iron and potentially improve the air stability. And so in yellow, we find quite a few dopants that really help with the, uh, 
the electrochemistry. They do the same role as iron, right? A very smooth curve here. Uh, and they, they ended up making purely this P2 phase. So really good performance. <coughs> the other thing we found that was really interesting, so this is a little bit of an aside, is a high voltage peak appeared in a lot of buildings. And so if we think about what's in this material, there's manganese, which gets oxidized down at two to three volts. It doesn't get oxidized up at high voltage. Sodium doesn't change its oxidation state. These dopants like cesium or calcium, they don't change their oxidation state. So this peak has to be oxygen. So we found a number of dopants that induce this anionic redox. So I talked earlier that, you know, if we could move the oxygen bands up in energy, that means lower in voltage, and suddenly they, they appear. So in the iron sample, the oxygen bands would be at a voltage way up here that we can't access. <clears throat> but if we add calcium, we pull it down in voltage. So can we learn how to predict that? And so I'll, I'll go through this a little bit quickly because uh, I'm a little bit short on time. But we found a metric uh, that was able to predict what induces this anionic redox. So first of all, which elements do cause this, this redox? If we look at the four to 4.3 volts, so the high voltage, then in red, we get three regions in the periodic table. We get a region over here, and then over here, and in the lanthanides. And so we, we tried a number of different things, and then we found that something called the bond valence mismatch does a really good job of predicting this. We find all three hotspots are, are lit up by this bond valence mismatch. And the way to interpret this, it's an empirical calculation, very easy to do. It's an Excel spreadsheet. It takes 10, 20 minutes, and it's, you've done all of this. So it's a very easy calculation to do. And what it means here is cesium has a value of minus 20 for the manganese site. So this means for cesium to fit, to be happy, it has to lose 20 electrons to fit on the manganese site. So then you say, well, it won't go on the manganese site. It goes on the, the sodium site. So to go on the sodium site, it has to lose six electrons. It's way too big, and yet it doesn't. It goes in somehow. So when it goes in, it distorts everything like crazy. So it destabilizes the oxygens that are around it, raises their energy, and then suddenly you can access them in the voltage. So we learned essentially how to predict what dopants induce this anionic redox. And this could be really important in terms of being able to increase the energy density. Okay, so that little aside, but a really interesting story that came out of this. The other thing that was very interesting is that some of these dopants really dramatically improve the <coughs> air stability. So I, I know my 30 minutes are basically up, so I'll just go through this quickly. If you look at an undoped material in a few weeks in a, a humid atmosphere, it, can, it completely converts from its pristine phase that you can see with this peak in the XRD to something else. And if we put 5% lithium, and in this case, 5% cobalt, but there are a number of uh, co-dopants with lithium that keep the, the original phase at 99%. So undoped was 0%, and then we put 5% lithium, and we get 99% of the original phase. So we've really dramatically improved the air stability of these materials with a very small amount of doping. <coughs> okay, so some elements like lithium play a huge role in stabilizing these materials. So for example, 5% lithium and 5% iron looks really, really good. So on the theme of trying to get sodium, iron, manganese to work, we're getting, we're getting close. We're doing some really good stuff. And I'll just end, you know, quickly talking about, uh, this is a, a paper we've just submitted for publication. This is the work with Umicore. We were able to do more, more doping on different materials. And again, we see a big change in the air stability. And we're, we're now starting to look at machine learning. So if we just plot that air stability versus different parameters, we get rectangles. We get no correlation whatsoever because they're all interrelated. It doesn't depend just on one parameter. It depends on all of them at the same time. 
and they don't go together. So we've cranked it through the machine, basically, and we're able to get a nice correlation and we're able to learn from it. So without going into too many details, it's a direction that my group is going. You can imagine with all the data that we collect, um, using machine learning both to predict new compositions and also to learn from our data is going to be a really powerful way forward. So in conclusion, you know, a multitude of battery chemistries will be required if we're going to transition to full electrification of transportation. I talked about sodium ion batteries. There's no question that lithium ion batteries are going to continue to be huge, uh, at least for the next 10 years. And then we'll see what else emerges. Uh, but there's going to be a lot of a lot of new chemistry coming through. Systems of interest are really complex. So high throughput methods are really powerful. For sodium ion batteries, we were able to improve the battery performance somewhat, but most critically really change the stability in air. So we're building up the full picture of what role substitutions can play. And this has significance on what will be commercialized. Uh, hopefully in the, the foreseeable future. All right, so thank you very much for your attention. I'm happy to take questions. Thank you so much again, Professor McCullough. Your talk was very interesting and it raised a lot of questions. So thank you. Uh, please join us for the Q&A session and feel free to ask any questions. Um, so in terms of questions, I do have one in regards to the size difference between lithium and sodium. So there's a difference in the atom size. Is there any noticeable difference in that efficiency between the two? Yeah, yeah. So the, the, the size, it, it sounds like such a, a small, small change, right? It, it's lithium plus sodium plus. You know, the same charge. It yeah. takes some of the same structures. You, you would think, you know, everything behaves itself. It, it actually causes a lot of problems. Um, a lot of the materials that work well with lithium ion batteries work very poorly. So graphite, sodium does not go into graphite. Ah, okay. uh, we're not using hard, hard carbon because it's particularly better. We're using it because it's the only one that works. Ah, so the size okay. has really dramatic impact. On the cathode side, structures that work really well with lithium uh, sometimes aren't even stable. So lithium cobalt oxide is the historical, you know, the first, first cathode used for lithium ion batteries. You can't make that structure with all the sodium in it. You have okay. to make it with a fraction of the sodium because it doesn't want to go into that environment. It's an octahedral environment that lithium goes into. Um, okay. Sodium really likes to be in a prismatic environment. So ah. the, the layer structure, so when I talked about the stacking, the stacking impacts the environment <laughs> the atom between the oxygen layers. So yeah. it goes from being octahedral to prismatic. And that yes. has all sorts of consequences. So yeah, uh, there's a lot, lot of impact. Okay. Okay, that's cool to know. Um, another question I had was, what exactly is hard carbon? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I, I'm not an expert, but it, basically, if you think of graphite as being perfect layers. Okay, yeah. That, that you know go on more or less continuously in, in both directions. Hard carbon will be graphitic layers, but they're kind of stacked like a house of cards. Okay. So you, you uh, get you, you get a combination. So in graphite, when I talked about lithium going in, that, that's called intercalation. So lithium intercalates into the, into the layer and then comes out again. Okay. You have some of that in hard carbon. So you have some layers that are just happen to be stacked well enough that you can still intercalate. But you also end up having surface reaction. You have, you've created so much surface area by making this house mm -hmm. of cards that you get some surface, uh, basically deposition and, and reduction. Ah, okay, okay, that makes sense. Um, okay, so another question from the audience. Uh, okay, so we have lithium and sodium batteries. So is it possible to make divalent cation batteries using uh, elements such as magnesium, for example? Yeah, yeah it, it's absolutely possible. Uh, okay. Research is going on in that direction. Uh, it's challenging, it, it, it's tough. And 
so the, there, there's reasons why magnesium ion in particular could, could be really, really good. Um, mm -hmm. So I talked about using graphite as the anode. <coughs> the reason we can't use lithium metal as the anode, this is you know, well known, it forms these dendrites. So as you cycle lithium back and forth, you get uneven plating on the lithium, mm -hmm. and then eventually you get a short circuit. And that's, that's when you get uh, fires and uh, there's a lot of safety concerns. Magnesium yeah. doesn't do that. So you can actually use magnesium metal as the anode. Uh, okay. So that there's tons of reasons to, to look at this. Turns out the electrolyte has been such a nightmare that it, it doesn't seem to be particularly close to commercialization. Uh, okay. But it, it is possible, and that, that might be a technology that comes down the road. Okay, that's interesting. Um, how do sodium batteries compare in efficiency to the other battery systems, such as fiber batteries or hydrogen fuel cells, for example? Uh, so I, I missed the first one, fiber batteries? Yeah, fiber batteries, yeah. Uh, okay, so hydrogen fuel cells is the easy one to answer. Okay. They, they blow it out of the water. Okay. So sodium ion batteries, same as lithium ion batteries, you're talking about 80, 90% efficient. Okay. Hydrogen fuel cells, you're splitting water at 60%, you're running your fuel cell at 60%. 60 squared is 36%. Mm. The full cycle efficiency is very low. Okay. So efficiency wise, there's, there's no conversation. <laughs> it, it can still be green, right? If you're using, yeah purely renewable energy to do that, that cycle. Uh, yeah. There can be reasons to do that. But if you're, if you're doing uh, steam reforming to make your hydrogen, it's, it's game over from a sustainability point of view. Okay. Um, so, you know, we have to really think carefully about the full cycle. So the efficiencies are good for, for sodium ion batteries. Um, okay. that, that's not, that's not going to be a, a huge, huge problem. Fiber battery, I, I, that doesn't say anything to me. What, okay. can you give me more details about what a fiber uh, battery is? Uh, it looks like this question just said fiber batteries. So it, I don't know more than that word, unfortunately. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, you know, feel free to, to reach out to me, you know, email me if you, you have follow-up questions on that. I, I, I'm not sure what that means. Okay, no problem. Um, let me see what other questions, uh, okay. So another question is, uh, why do you focus on using manganese and iron specifically in terms of the metals? Yeah. So I mean, there's two two reasons. Uh, the 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 main one is that they, they work, right? They, okay. they give a good battery, and they're so abundant okay. that you know if, if we can get these last few issues with. Uh, the air stability um, it can be, you know, from a, a green chemistry point of view, it can be really important. Okay. Um, so those are the main two reasons. Um, okay. and the, the question I'm, I'm often finding myself asking, and I have some collaborators now that do life cycle analysis. Um, mm -hmm. but one of the questions I'm asking is, if we need some dopants, or you know, if we substitute 5% lithium or 5% whatever it is that we need to make these things work, what's the impact on, on the life cycle? Can we get away with 5% or can we only get away with 1%? So and we don't really know the answer to that. You know, okay. does, it still, does it still remain sustainable if it's sodium, iron, manganese, and 3% indium, you know, um, if we really go exotic? So there are a lot of questions from that point of view. But, okay. But if we ever, you know, were able to get it to work just with sodium, iron, and manganese, um, there's no question it would be really meaningful from a, a sustainability point of view. Makes sense, yeah. Um, another question related to that is, what exactly is the purpose of the metal dopant in these batteries? Yeah, well, in, in the examples that I, I showed, uh, it kind of depends what you, you call a dopant. So if you start with sodium manganese oxygen, like I did in the last example, um, then the dopants have to play a number of roles because sodium iron mang or sorry, sodium manganese oxide at the compositions that I showed is not single phase. So it makes two different structures. 
So the, the open has to favor one or the other, right? Yeah. So that's one of the roles. It, it can force force the material into a particular structure. Hmm. Uh, it can also, like I showed, prevent these phase transitions during the cycling, right? That 5% iron prevented the structure from changing during cycling, and that's very important. And yeah. then now we're also finding this air stability. So it, th these, these dopants can tune a lot of different properties. Um, okay. And we're, we're finding that across my research program, where we're not just working on sodium ion cathodes, we're working on solid electrolytes. And there we have five or six properties that need to be optimized at once. Um, okay. And same thing, dopants play a lot of different roles. It gets, it gets really tricky. Yeah, yeah, it makes sense. Um, another question related to something you said is, uh, what exactly are solid electrolyte batteries and how does that make them different from other batteries? Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, you know, could have given another seminar just on solid, solid batteries because these can also be game changing. Um, so currently the, the lithium ion batteries that are going into EVs and being scaled up like crazy, all have carbonate-based liquid electrolytes. They perform really well. They have good lifetime, good energy density. They're, they're really good batteries. They're also flammable. So ah. when you get a failure, that's, that's where you get the fire. Yeah. So if you substitute it with a solid, hmm. you get rid of that, that concern. You know, the solids are not gonna catch fire. So safety-wise, you know, it's, it's already a big win. But then you need a solid that conducts lithium, doesn't conduct electrons, is stable at high voltage with the cathode, is stable at low voltage with either lithium or the anode. Mm -hmm. And then these, these anodes and cathodes expand, they get bigger and smaller. So you put a solid in there and it needs to maintain contact to both sides. Mm -hmm. It's a huge challenge, tons of properties we have to optimize at once. So that's why it doesn't exist yet. It, some companies are getting very close, right? Um, yeah. There are quite a few startups that have been, you know, making great progress. And it looks like car companies are thinking that's going to be a reality in five, ten years. Okay. Um, things exist and, and they will, will be commercialized, it looks like. Okay, that's promising for the future then. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. Another question. Uh, how does your group choose which metals to use as a dopant? Yeah, my, my favorite answer is we just try them all. Okay. <laughs> uh, and, and I actually have some students that try very hard to fill in the few gaps we still have in the periodic table. Um, okay. And, you know, people question whether this is the, the right way to do things. Uh, the truth is that it doesn't impact the students' time money, right? We do 64 at once. Yeah. So why not just throw everything in? And we've had some surprises. Um, so, you know, prior to what we're doing now, groups would always have reasons to try a dopant because it was a big time investment. Yeah. For us, it's not so much of a big time investment. So we'll, we'll try everything. Uh, what, what if, you know, we, we didn't, you know, in, intuition can fail us sometimes, chemical intuition. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I always smile when I say that because I, I collaborate with some machine learning groups now. And they don't agree with me that what I do is chemical intuition. It's biasing data. That's what they call it. They call it biasing data. So the best best way is to try everything, right? Yeah. Don't, don't yeah. bias the data. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that actually relates to the idea of like big data. Like because you're getting so much data, how do you actually end up? Do you have enough time to go through all of the data that you generate yeah it, it's a great question um <laughs> i you know I, I very badly want to answer yes and and for the most part it is yes um, okay we we've written some software to, to process the data efficiently um mm -hmm. we do we do put eyes on all the data uh, okay but you, you, you don't necessarily always get the depth that you would if you worked on one composition. Okay. And, and so, you know, I, I mentioned that a student can work on 1,500 samples a year. That's true. But that same student might work on three the next year. 
because they might have found three really good questions and they want to spend okay. a lot of time learning what's going on there. Uh, yeah. So there, there's breadth and depth and yeah. there's a, a difference between the two for my group for sure. Okay. So in relation to that answer, there are two more follow-up questions that I have, which is when do you decide to scale up? And the other question will be, um, will ma machine learning app applications be used? Uh, you did show a little bit of how it was used, but could you apply more of it to uh, this research? And are there any disadvantages to doing that? <coughs> yeah, so I'll, I'll answer the machine learning one first. Um, okay. Because we, we are working on this. We're working on it very actively. So we're, we're, uh, there's a, a, a paper we wrote uh, last year that we looked at substitutions into a, a particular material called lithium cobalt phosphate. And we did, you know, all, we, we did 47 dopants in that case. No problem. And then we did some co doping. So now we're talking about 47 squared, right? Combination. Yeah. And that's yeah. just at one doping level. Wow. So, yeah. so then we didn't do it so systematically. We, we picked a good dopant out of the 47 and then co doped with everything else. Hmm. So, you know, you, you can justify that. It made sense. We made a really good material out of it. Okay. <laughs> but then, you know, the performance well, had not, not plateaued. We, I was pretty confident there were still improvements to be made. So we, I talked to this machine learning group in Montreal and uh, said, you know, what could you do about helping us screen triple dopants, right? 47 cube, forget about it. We're, we're not doing anything near systematic uh, with that. So we've been working with them and the, the jury's not out. So, you know, my, my, my vision is that at some point we're gonna write some sort of paper that says man versus machine. <laughs> and I honestly don't know what the answer is, what, who's gonna win. Um, okay. It's really hard uh, to do machine learning on multiple properties, right? We're not just trying to optimize one metric. We're trying to maximize five or six, minimize a couple, maximize the rest. Um, yeah. So that's really difficult to do. So they're working on developing those tools. Um, I, I think it's going to be really powerful. Um, but uh, that, that's kind of where we're at for that. The jury's not out whether it's going to work or not. Um, oh, fair. Fair. <laughs> for, for this particular application. Um, yeah. And then which materials we scale up? It, it's a tough question. Um, so the, the answer is kind of becoming, you know, we're, we're working with collaborators. Um, mm. You know, I don't, I don't have students who are, you know, have a spin-off company or trying to scale these things up themselves. Mm. So we, we, we share the data with the industrial partners. And then they they decide to protect the IP, and then we work with them uh, to look at scale up. Um, yeah. There's a there's an example of that going on now in my lab. Um, so the, the the company for their application decided that it was worth uh, really giving it a serious go for scale up, and so we're we're doing some in the lab here, and and they're eventually going to do some. Um, okay. So so there you're you know. You only want to scale up to to a large scale when there's some sort of application at the end of the, the line. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, otherwise it's not worth it. Feasible. No. <laughs> uh, I mean, we, we certainly want to know if there's a particular material we're making that is not scalable. Um, mm -hmm. We've done some mini scale ups, and, and we've been able to find out that some of them are, are quite challenging. Okay. Um, knowing that is, I think. Quite valuable. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Makes sense. Yeah. It definitely helps in the long term. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, that's all we have uh, in terms of time. But thank you so much for your presentation and for all the questions we've answered. Uh, I will now pass this back to my co chair, Wadid, to do the closing. Thank you again, Prof. McCullough. Thank you. So, thanks everyone for all the interesting questions. So, for our closing, uh, please stay tuned for our next IYC and Science Cafe series for the next uh, Top 10 Emerging Technology for 2023. And for now, if anyone is interested in like following up with us, 
uh, here we have an array of uh, or a number of videos of previously uh, previously arranged science cafes you can find it through our channel and through this link uh, we also commit to equity diversity and inclusion at the network we would like to help all chemists around the world globally so uh, and we would like to provide a constructive route for bridging international borders so if anyone is interested please connect with us and become a member and have your impact on this committee uh, especially this committee or the IYCN as a, in general. Finally, I would like to personally thank our speaker, Professor Eric, for answering all the questions. Uh, the uh, topic was interested, was interesting, uh, especially like explaining from taking us from the lithium ion batteries to the sodium, and then taking us in the in the challenge that you faced and the doping that you made. I'm not familiar with the topic, but it was quite interesting. So thank you, Professor Eric, and thanks all our audience. Uh, please follow us on IYCN uh, on all social media or visit us through our website and wait for us for the next IYCN Science Cafe. Thank you.